Hello, everyone, and welcome to the show. It is Local Chat, episode 154. Joining me this week, as always, is the great, the wonderful, and amazing shelf behind me. Wow. You know, I thought you, you are never nice to me. You're always an asshole. To, no, wait, I'm always an asshole to you. Sorry, I got that backwards. <laughs> I got that confused there. Uh, Ian Gibson's here, as always. My alarm for when I normally wake up is going off. Um, it is a crazy, crazy week, uh, this week, uh, folks, but we're still here to talk about video games. The weather is here, uh, anime is here, uh, and we're just hanging out, having a good old time. Ian Gibson, let's get into it. Um, work life is stressful. Uh, tell me about how much you want to, uh, play video games. Run away. Um... I definitely want to play video games. We're live on Twitch, right? Just doing a quick yeah, check. We're live on Twitch, so you can't say anything. Horrible. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> okay, all right. Just got to be okay. Let me just cross all these things off my off my list. Um, video games. I've been playing one that you recommended last week. The Norp Apologue. Is that how we? That's okay. I I think we've got Norp right. Right. Yes. That's how you say Norp. G N O R P. A P O L O G U, which I'm not even sure if I spelled it correctly. I fixed your spelling. <laughs> okay, Apolog. I think that's what that is, right? I think um, it is Apolog. If you want to look up if that's a real word, real quick, while I talk about Norp Apolog. So this is a, um, <clears throat> it's an incremental idler. It starts out as a clicker, but it's less of a clicker. It's more of an idler game. So you've you got little guys and they are hitting a rock and chipping pieces off of it. And then they carry the pieces to a collection point. And that's kind of your currency. And that lets you unlock housing, which gets you more guys to damage the rock or more guys to carry. And then you've got different ways of hitting the rock and different ways of carrying. It's a pretty cool little game. It's it's very minimalistic. Uh, it's not exactly uh monotone or monocolor black and white but it's mostly two colors white for the people whatever color you want for the background and then um some effects have some colors and stuff but it's very simple but it it just does a really good gameplay loop um i think i played like 10 hours over the past week like there was i want to say sunday yeah sunday we were out of town i got back like 2 or 3 p.m. I was like, let me just try this game. And then I just played it to like nine. Like I played it for like six or seven hours straight. Um, <laughs> it's it's very it's very cool. It's a great little idler clicker. Um, I got up to compression level seven. What, what was your highest compression level, Will? I. I think it was six or seven. I got to a point where the compression and the gains were counteracting each other and I couldn't move up a level. And yeah, like that's that's kind of yeah. So basically, the way compression works is as your guys are hitting things off the rock, it forms like a pile of refuse. I wouldn't say pile of refuse, but it almost looks like a big landfill pile, and that's mm -hmm. what they're pulling from to collect. Um, which is really cool because there's this unit type called mountaineers, and their whole thing is that they climb and sit on top of the pile and just throw things from the top of the pile to closer to the collection point. Um, which is, it's a really cool little neat idea. Like they could have just been like, you know, the pieces fall off the rock, collect them into the collector. But they're like, no, what if there's too many of them? Then it piles, right? And then compression is all about if the pile gets too big, then it will compress itself and go back into the rock. But in doing so, you get a little unique resource that you can use to do special upgrades and stuff. Um, and it compounds and I, the, the currency into a new level. Yes, yeah. Um, and so I think I feel like that's basically the end game, I think, is getting to compression level 10 from what I can tell. Um, but like Will was saying, each time you hit a compression level. <clears throat> what I think is really unique about this idler incremental game is that you have to balance and sometimes not balance how much damage you're doing to the rock to build the pile and how much you are pulling from the pile, because pulling from the pile how quickly you are pulling or collecting things from the pile gives you a skill point. And that skill point is what you can do to unlock uh, bonuses and benefits and upgrades run to run. Um, 
So it's really cool. Like, like you're saying, sometimes you're balancing it just to keep the game going and get you some currency. Sometimes you're like, I got to build the pile to get compression, to get the unique currency to upgrade a building. Other times you're like, no, I need skill points because I have zero skill points unlocked this run. And that means it's basically worthless in the grand scheme of things. So I got to, I got to, you know, uh, build the pile and then build all my collectors and have the collectors just try and collect as quickly as possible and focus on that for a bit. So it's pretty neat. It's pretty neat. I do think, um, like you said, it kind of hits this difficulty. I wouldn't say spike, but it hits. It's kind of the problem I have with all idle incremental games, which is how they're built, where at the beginning you're unlocking things so quickly and then they always hit a point where it feels like you have to just idle for like 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And it is an idler game, but at the same time, I wish games handled that better. This one is not too bad. There are games that do it worse. Um. But it's definitely in that moment where I thought about Vampire Survivors. Now, you mm. you weren't a big fan of Vampire Survivors last year, right? No, I, it, it didn't quite do it for me. Yeah, and, and I think Vampire Survivors was one of those games that I played a lot of. I probably played 30, 40 hours of it. But at the end of the day, towards the end, I realized I am still playing this game, but I'm not getting enjoyment out of this game. I'm playing this game because its mechanisms and its hooks have fully gotten into me. And I feel it's not obligated, but I feel an itch to play this game, to keep playing it, keep playing it, keep playing it. And the enjoyment's gone. And that's kind of what hit with Norp Apolog as well is. I was I was like, I'm going to get to compression level 10. I'm going to beat this game. But by the time I got to six or seven, I was like, OK, now I'm kind of in the grindy phase. I'm just playing this because I'm already playing it and it has hooks in me, but I'm not. Yeah, I I felt like I hit kind of a mechanical plateau. And at this point now, I would have to just do a bunch of runs and try and min max my skill point allocation. So it's a really cool game. If you're into idlers incrementals, definitely try it out. It's just a shame that it it still falls in some of the genres problem spots and it falls a bit into the vampire survivor spot of you're going to stop enjoying the game long before you stop playing it. And for me, that doesn't feel good. That feels like the game doesn't have monetizations, but that feels like a casino heavily monetized mob mobile game where they don't care that you're enjoying it they just want you to keep playing it and i don't like mechanics that do that yeah and and it's funny too because most of the i don't know if it was its specific subreddit or just a reddit but it was a lot of posts of being like hey i just want to finish the game what should i pick to finish the game and it was a exactly. lot of those posts and it was like oh i i kind of see where they're coming from and then um I was, secondly i was gonna say it's like a good idle game needs a second game in it that you can do while the idling is happening. And yeah, it's counterintuitive and... because most, again, idle games, you're not supposed to be doing something while the stuff's racking up. But if someone could yeah. harness that power and do something. Yeah. You know, it may be time to go back and play universal paper clips. Cause I remember it having a bunch of mechanics like stock market and stuff that maybe that's why that game worked so well was because it basically had that it had enough mechanics going on that you could always go somewhere else while a, a different mechanic was idling. Yeah. And I think like to some extent it's completely different, but it's like always having something to do was the great thing about Elden Ring is like that they took yeah. from Dark Souls where you didn't have to hit your head against a thing for an hour. So it's like you need that in other genres now to like allow yeah. you to do other things. So Open world idle game. Yeah. <laughs> actually yeah that's actually not a bad idea you just I mean, go start a different is. idol company while the first one's running oh fuck wait factory well Factorio, factorio's yeah. factorio's kind of an idler though because i was about to say like you you're like oh i need to go i need to go set up my rock idler to feed into my I, here what? idler it's the other thing is i quit factorio when there's i'm stressed because there's too much to do not because there's not enough to do Man, I didn't even mention that over the over the holidays. I had a after Steam World build was slightly disappointing. I had a relapse and I played. I, I started Factorio save and I played like twelve hours I know. on the weekend. I saw you. I almost messaged you and I was like, I can't. I can't get into it. Yeah, we we should we should do a multiplayer again though because I will say the I, I installed a couple mods that I've done before, but the one that I really did was I think it's called Factorissimo, which is basically you build you get buildings and the building is. I think the small building is like 12 by 12 squares Yeah, and you place it down, you go inside it and you have a factory that's, you have a building that's 30 by 30 
and then you can always put you feed stuff into the building from the outside so it just made it super organized because like my furnaces taking my iron into my into my iron plate um it was like i just had the miners they have four conveyor belts going off them and they go into this building and the building has a giant iron plate icon on it right and that's the overworld that's it and the other side of the building feeds out iron plates i go in the building and it's just furnaces it's like it's an incredible way to organize it and collapse it and it doesn't really feel like i'm cheating in the game like i feel like the only game mechanic that i'm avoiding by doing that is trying to fit things on the map around resources and trees and cliffs but other than that it feels like the same game it's just way cleaner and more organized and yeah let's play factorio factorio yeah let's just play factorio it's great you know that uh, um that uh minecraft factorio satisfactory that isn't out yet but it had that steam fest demo is it was pretty good they had a good way of doing it uh-huh. where their um you made platform blocks and those supplied power to all the machines on it so you would oh, almost that's nice. like that's nice so, so anything you connected to that would end up uh, doing that yeah. but their their placement stuff was a little rough but it was also early access yeah that 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 is the other nice thing about the factory is as long as you supply power to the factory building then inside the building you don't have to run any power lines everything placed in there has oh, power that's nice yeah i like that um yeah so it's 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 really cool the other thing is um i was dyson sphere program recently released their combat update which means there's now enemies in the game that can attack you and attack your planets and attack your ships that game i think i may like that game a little i think i like it more than factorio now because Mm -hmm. of some of the logistic stuff it does on their roadmap is multiplayer so when that when that hits multiplayer we've got to play that multiplayer because that's especially when you get to the mid game, you start going to other planets and then it's like, Hey, how about you go to that planet and set up all of our steel production on that planet? Right. And I'll go over here and do copper and we'll feed that into the main and we'll come back. Oh, fuck that game. So anyways, um, wasn't planning on talking about that today, but I did. Uh, <laughs> um, the other game we played was lethal company. So this is the, uh, multiplayer Roblox game. Did you, did you, did you know the dev is from Roblox? He's like a big uh, yes. Roblox dev. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. That's not surprising at all. Because <laughs> that's no offense, but it feels like a Roblox game, like a good Roblox game where it's a bit more experimental, a bit more like like quirky, weird. Um, there were there were two things that kind of struck me about this game immediately. First time I played it um, was the aesthetics. Like it leans heavy into its aesthetic, which is kind of like it's kind of I mean, I would say like analog grunge is what i would say um, but like with some yeah and, and with some color on it like even just like the menu text have like a gr- like the font has a grunge on it and i love games that pick an aesthetic understand that aesthetic and fully implement it and that's fantastic and i i really like the look of the game um the other thing was the sound design i normally don't really care about sound design in games i'm not some weirdo um the same as music where i'm like hey this song's cool but i'm not gonna like jerk off to the time signature or anything um (laughs) but like immediately as soon as we got into the game i was like yo the sound design in this game is incredible and what i mean by that was even just in the ship like if we're standing next to each other okay big one out of the way it has proximity voice chat which is something that should be in all fucking multiplayer games now quite frankly if your game does not have proximity voice chat and it has to be proximity voice chat it can't be what fucking call of duty is doing now where if you're within 50 feet then they just join your voice lobby but you can't tell where they're speaking from or how far away they are if you're a multiplayer game you need to have proximity voice chat period there's no excuse anymore but beyond that the way that it was modifying people's voices like even when we're in the ship if we're next to each other it's perfectly clear if you step 10 feet away it gets this metallic echo to it you know um if you're out in the open it's a different sound you know um just even just the basic sound effects of walking through the ship picking things up and down walking across the ground is very very good it adds so much fucking atmosphere that you're not just talking to each other that you're talking to each other in like an empty metallic tube and you can hear the the echo the metallic clang it's fantastic how much that adds to it um and then the other thing was there are definitely some moments when we were playing when i was alone 
And I, I don't think I'm making this up. And normally it's something I would not like in a horror game, but I think it works really well. There were moments where I was just like chilling in the ship, right? And the doors open. So there's no fucking noise except for like the slight hum of the ship. And I'm like, okay, you hear a little bit of the outside. Okay. And I swear there are, there were not monsters, but they play at like negative 30 dB, just very slight monster noises, like a little, <laughs> like, like you almost hear like a little gurgle or a burp and you're just like, what the fuck's going on? But it's so subtle that it's just like, Hey, be on your toes, buddy. Like it's not a jump scare. You know, we're just be on your toes. And it's so it's so good. The sound design in this game. Um, so, yeah, so we were playing. This is my first time on stream. I hopped in. Karen and Will were already in a game, so I hopped in and joined them. And then uh, Chris from Save Data joined us later. Um, my first time playing the game. And so in the stream, I think halfway through, I, th I think I said the phrase. I think I hate this. Did I say I think I hate this game or I think I don't like this game? I can't I, remember. You know, I tuned you out about 15 minutes in. <laughs> That's fair. Um, I, in retrospect, I think that judgment, that statement is a bit too harsh. Um, it was more of a knee-jerk reaction at the time. I did have some problems with this game, though. And I think the first one is not with the game, but with how we played it. And it's it's the idea of playing a game versus streaming a game. And we've talked about this before. You can't just play a game on stream. You can, but then you're you're a bad streamer, right? You're not just playing a game and sharing your screen. You've got to talk. You got to interact with the audience. You got to put on some sort of entertaining show. Um, that's super important, right? And so when I hopped in, you and Karen were in the middle of a save and you guys were taking the game, in my opinion, way too fucking seriously, where you were like, don't touch that. We got to make quota. OK, we got to pick the right planet. OK, don't open the door. And it's just like and I'm like. This is not entertaining for stream. So like the first 15 minutes, I was deliberately the wild card. You know, I'm clicking things. I'm picking things. I'm running out of the ship. I'm pretending not to hear you. And I think it made for a good stream. But I, it was also, you know, messing with your play style. And I think both styles are, are adequate. But it definitely led to, you know, a little bit of contention between us the first 15, 20 minutes of the game because you guys were trying to actually play it. And I'm trying to to you know, push the boundaries a bit and see what fun you can have in the game. I, I, I'm pretty sure you guys felt that tension as well, right? Between the different play styles. I seriously considered never playing a video game with you ever again. Uh, <laughs> but I understand what you're saying. And I think there's that point where that game becomes a very good stream game. And I was just, I was trying to fast forward to that point with you. And you were trying to slow down and keep it in where you were. Because, and, and I think the other problem is we only had three of us and then four of us where the like modded six or seven people is a little bit better in that game for streaming because you have the separate groups that can go off and do stuff. And when someone dies, you can cycle through all the people. But yeah, I, I think, I think it was just like us both sides trying to like make an entertaining stream. And I think we kind of clashed in the middle. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I will push back on that slightly. Where I don't think you guys were be, trying to be entertaining at all. You guys were super laser focused on just playing the game, and that was not fun for the stream. So, but yeah. I, I, I do think at the end of the day we had a good stream though. The clash plus the weird shit I was doing, like, like there was a there was a very good moment right where, where um. We finally land on a planet and I, I pick up the walkie talkie and you guys are like, OK, we're going to stick together. Don't pick that up. You don't need that. And I open the door and I fucking take off running. Right. And I take off running, and turn around and rock. And you guys are just like, no, Ian, wait, you don't know how to play the game. Wait, wait. And I'm just like in the end of the stream. I'm just like, they're treating me like a baby. I'm going to I'm going to be a wild card. And I'm just like run around the rock. And I like and I would like open the mic on the on the. I would turn the walkie talkie on, open the mic and be like, hello, can you hear me? And then immediately turn the mic off and just keep running. And so I ran for like a minute in just a circle. And at some point I could hear you guys being like, hello, where did he go? Like off in the distance. And I just do a circle and I get back in the ship and I'm like, let's see how long it takes them to figure it out. <laughs> and so I'm like just talking with the stream, dicking with the computer and the microphone. I'm just going to say it. If people watching the stream, like I think Halucha found it entertaining. I thought it was very entertaining stream for me to like pretend to be an idiot. And you guys are like freaking out. And you're like, you have to hold down the button to talk in the walkie talkie. And can you hear us? And it was just hysterical. That being said, 
totally understand how frustrating that is for you guys because you guys were kind of the butt of that joke. Um, it was it was very entertaining. I do have a, a mechanical problem with the game, though, which is that stupid fucking scrap mechanic. I OK, so if you guys haven't played the game. It tur- OK, before I played this game, I was seeing clips. I saw descriptions, etc. And I thought this game was like Deep Rock Galactic, right? Where you go on these missions and the mission is go to this location and we pick what you have to do from kind of a randomized list of five to ten different types of things. Right. You know, uh, go here, pick this up, uh, defend this location, take a picture of this guy, you know, get four people to this location, you know, get on and off in three minutes or whatever. This game, admittedly, early access does not have that. This game is just one thing, and that one thing is basically fucking boring, which is land on a planet, go into a building, keep clicking the right mouse button to scan for objects, pick up the object, take it back to your ship, and then go to another planet and sell it. That's the core loop of this game, and it's inherently built into the loop of this game with the whole quota, you gotta sell enough, etc. And that's not fun. That doesn't feel good. I, I I don't know. How do you feel about that? Uh, I like it because I like just exploring the facilities and like hiding from the monsters. Plus, there's a point where like that's good. You don't have to do anything anymore. Like most of the time, we just collect all the scrap from the first couple planets and then sell what we need to reach quota and keep what we don't to reach the next quota. And then you don't have to find scrap the rest of the time. You can just like go around and explore and check out monsters. But and I buy see, stuff. I th- I think that's. I think that's a point in my favor, though, because you're saying you are deliberately playing the game in a way such that you can avoid the main mechanic. No, that's just a way you you can play it. I mean, I don't think collecting scrap, I mean, it is the main mechanic, but the main mechanic is just like exploring and checking out the monsters. I was thinking about that because I was like, oh, it's early access. They'll just add additional mechanics. And I'm not saying they won't, but the fact that there's a quota and you have a limited number of days and you have to hit the quota so your and your run ends the entire run is built around collecting scrap yeah and i think i think that's a bad decision i i'm not saying get rid of the scrap completely i'm saying they need more variety they need instead of scrap it should be jobs right yeah so there should be like hey, hey we have a list of jobs one job is go collect the scrap it's 200 bucks worth of scrap right or hey we got a weird monster on this planet go take a picture of it you know and we'll give you a, a wonky little camera so it's something they could fix. It's just the way that it is right now. You're right. There's a lot of fun in exploring, etc. But I, I, when I think about playing that game, I want to play it with friends and have chaos and etc. I don't want to play that game seriously because playing it seriously requires me to like seriously interact and try and mid-max my scrap mechanic, etc. And I'm like, that's just not. That's, oh, yeah, that's not no. enjoyable to me. I, I don't think that's... Fu- I mean, that save, I think we've died more than we've completed a quota. Like, it's just fun mm-hmm. to, like, run around in the building and slowly watch everyone yeah. die and be like... Yes, that's fun. Hey, yes. I'm going to jump around this landmine and I just whiff and miss the railing. Like, yeah, it's hard to be good at that game. It's hard to be good at... Consi- you can be good at that game and still fuck up. Like, that's the fun yes. part about it. Um, and I think, like, I think if this game wasn't that popular and it was a fun party game, we you wouldn't be complaining about that mechanic. But since it got so popular and so many people are playing, and you want more out of it now that you're playing it so much, that that mechanic starts to get old. And, and I do agree. Like, I find it enjoyable, so I don't, I don't have that same reaction to it. But I think it's the same thing with, like, we were talking about with Norp. It's like, at some point, you're just like, I want something else to do. So I do yes. agree that, like, yeah. eventually... I mean, it's one developer, and the modding community is insane. Um, I mean, half the stuff we were doing is because of mods, which is nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So there'll be I stuff, just, like... There's, there's plenty yeah. of... Sorry, not to interrupt, but there's plenty of mods that are adding other things to do in <clears throat> in maps, so... Exactly, yeah. And so for me, this game is not... It's not like, hey... you We were talking beforehand about how you were playing this... You like this game so much you were playing it single player. I would never do that because for me, this is not a game to play because of the game. It's a game to play because of the party experience. And so, you know, no offense, but if like you and Karen were playing, you're like, come play local chat with us. I'd be like, no, it's not the right party. Right. Like, I know we're I know we're not going to 
it's not going to be a fun time with you guys because we have different play styles. Whereas if like there were more people, I think Save Data is going to play it tonight and they invited some of us. I may hop on for that. I don't know. It's it's like if the party's right, then hell yeah, you, let's do it. it it's like D&D in person, right? Like D&D is a cool system. It can work. It cannot work. It really depends heavily on the party and how they're playing together. Yeah. Um, and that's that's. I was going to say that's nothing against Lethal Company, but I think I think that is a bit of a something against Lethal Company, because if it was a great game, there would be enough there to pull me in regardless of the party or uh, solo. I, I should but mention it's st still cool. I, I, I didn't I, you might have misheard me. I, I play I meant I played it offline, like not streaming. I would never play this game solo ever. Too terrible. Oh, OK, okay. I, yeah, gotcha. I played gotcha. it offline with, with Karen and Chris and Vic, and I would say I you know, <clears throat> and I, I hate to say this, your play style's great. I just wanted you to understand the game we were playing before we got to that type of play style, because that is how all the other streams have gone, is that sort of nonsense. And it just, it, and I know you didn't mean it as well, it just felt like deliberately, hey, I'm going to stream this game that they like and shit on it the whole time, and that's how it came across. And oh, and I know you no, didn't no, no. mean it that way, but like that's why i was so pissed off because it just felt like that the whole time so i think i think there's two things going on here right and this is this is getting into this is couples therapy right <laughs> there's two things going on here and and one is my fault one is your fault right so one is my fault because when i got into the game you guys were trying to show me the game but my ego got in the way and when somebody starts to like talk down to me and baby me and be like here does this don't touch that my knee-jerk reaction is to me be like well, fuck you i'm smart enough to get this and so i just start dicking around right that's that's a flaw i have it was the wrong reaction to what you guys were trying to do i'll admit that the other thing that happened there that i think is your fault is before i played local company the only thing i think i've ever said about it was i don't want to play that game because it looks like a scary game and there and me being off local chat for several weeks and you guys joking about it has turned into this somehow thing where i'm gonna shit on this game and i hate this game even though i've never touched it or talked about it so i think that is you expecting me to hop in the stream and shit on the game is something that you have made up based off of uh, zero factual yeah, evidence yeah. I, I will say we were teasing you about that a lot going into the stream i did not I, when you said you were going to stream it i was genuinely happy and thought so like i see your point with that and for a while i did think you hated it for no apparent reason because we liked it but i just assumed it was a valheim situation where like you weren't playing it with zach yeah. and i yeah. and i'm like i know ian's gonna like this game so like i wasn't coming from it that way but also like we didn't have any pre-stream time to talk we were just in the game so i wasn't gonna like argue and be like an adult in the middle of a stream and be like like hey what's going on? like you know that sort of thing so no no i think i think you just had the false assumption that i did not like the game and i was there to shit on the game when there was no no actual evidence or inkling towards that because i've never said anything bad about the game etc yeah yeah, prior. yeah. I, that could have creeped in but for i i to be perfectly honest i i didn't think you hated it when we were talking about it before i just figured you thought it was scary and you didn't want to play it which is a usual thing. Like, it's the same thing I do with video games. Like, if I don't like something about it. So. Yeah. Um, um, but, but anyways, yeah. So, I, I did play it. I don't know. Depending on the party, I may play it again. Um, I, I'm a sucker for proximity voice chat. Like I said, the game has incredible sound design. It looks great. Um, it has the right level of shenanigans, and everybody's there for the shenanigans. I'm just not a fan of, like, the core mechanic, and that's the thing that's kind of pushing me away from it. Um, yeah. but you know, I, I am happy that it's successful and that a lot of people love it because for fuck's sake, people proximity voice chat is piss easy to implement and it should be the standard by now. It should absolutely be the standard and it pisses me off that it's not. Anyways, uh, those are the games I played. What do you, what have you been playing? Uh, I have been playing some games. They've been super fun. Uh, first game I'm playing, playing is Basilisk 2000. Um, this game is by Kira, who made Lost in Vivo, one of our first, I think the first Spooky Pixel game, uh, we ever played. And then... Oh, fuck. Uh, the, the one in the sewers, and yeah. then I killed a man with a bat? Yeah. Oh my god. And then they also made this game called Basilisk, which was a Super Nintendo, uh, RPG, 3D RPG. I don't know if it, um, I don't know if it is 
works on an actual Super Nintendo, but Super Nintendo graphics. So Basilisk 2000 is a found file system video game editor of the video game Basilisk 2000. You play the entire game in the game editor. You have a little window uh-huh. you're looking through. You have a list of all the local objects. Uh, and you just you have some options and you have load scene. Uh, so you spawn in Haven Town. There's a little thing that says like, oh, here is where we show the opening cinematic. And open cinematic is in yellow. So you type load open cinematic and it plays the opening cinematic for you. And then you go around the village and you like you slowly realize you can just change the scale of everything. There's people around. Then there's people who aren't on the local object list. Why in the top of this building is there a corpse of a mutilated child who was your childhood rival? Um, And you're just like, you're walking around and then you find some signs that lead to new places. So you hit load Nimor and you you load into this desert uh, area and there's people mutilated corpses everywhere people being hung uh and like uh-huh. people being like where's our water essence we need our water essence go to this town to get our water essence and you're trying to separate like what the game is about versus what uh or, or you're trying to separate what the original basilisk 2000 is about versus what this text this video editor is about because you get to the point where you're like you spawn into the office of the game company and they're just like they just hate their lives and there's this all these posters that are like oh, there are other games but they're blank and then there's like hidden uh, hidden notes about wanting to burn the place down uh Jeez. and it, i haven't found any, everything in it there's a there's a discord there's a big spoiler doc but I, and it wasn't organized well so i didn't want to scroll through it and get spoiled on a bunch of stuff but i found some like yellow words that i have to piece together and i started a whole notes document uh it is really cool um just the way they do it like playing in a in a in a in a level editor is a really neat idea um i i do wish it was a little more coherent i may have missed a couple things but i think this style of game but uh a a more puzzle path sort of thing and not um what do they call it like not augmented reality uh that sort of thing uh would be a lot more fun, but it is still super fun. It's two dollars on itch.io, uh, so I would I would highly recommend to go play it. It is it is a really fun game. Yeah, it looks cool, and it is on our Goaty nominee list, so I, I will be picking it up at some point. It's true, I got it on there. Uh, and uh, I want to play Basilisk. It's free, the SNES one. I downloaded it. I'm gonna sneeze, but it's not coming. Is it? Ah, <laughs> oh, sweet, nice dab. Um, nice. Is it? Is it an RPG as well, or is it a different style game, Basilisk? I believe it, it described it as a Super Nintendo 3D RPG. So I, I don't. That's just what Itch said. So I don't know if it's another weird thing with like stuff hidden in it, or if it's just a straight like they just made a normal game. Because Lost in Vivo was just a normal horror, spooky horror game. Um, so I'll have to go check sure. it out. I did download it. Uh, the second game I've been playing is Halls of Torment. Um, you mentioned earlier I didn't like Vampire Survivors that much. I have found my Vampire Survivors. This game is so good. It is way better than Vampire Survivors, and I am just saying that as me. Um, is this a Vampire Survivors game? It is a Vampire is Survivors this, game in the style of this, Diablo. Is this an ass, an auto-shooter survival? Yes. So it is. it has auto-shooting, auto-aiming. Uh, you can also manually shoot and manually aim, which is great for moments when you need to... Uh, Because you don't shoot in all directions. Like, you have different weapons. Um, Mm -hmm. There's four levels out currently. It's an early access. Took me about 20 hours to unlock all of them. Uh, There's 11 characters. Uh, I'm still going through them all. Um, You get loot down in the levels. And you you can save one piece of loot to send it back up. When you save the loot back up, you buy it off the guy and you have it permanently. There's no risk of losing it. Nice. So then I have like a whole, for my fire guy, I have a whole equipment to boost all his burn chances and burn stuff and flame boots. God damn it. Um, Halls of Torment. I, that is the game. And I said this about Vampire Survivors. Like you guys were all like, oh, one more run, one more run. And I was like, I don't see it. Halls of Torment, one more run, one more run. Uh, I listened 
I've been listening to Japanese city pop from the 70s. I went through about 16 hours of those videos on YouTube just playing Halls of Torment. It is a great game to play while like watching Star Trek or or uh, any or listen to podcasts, any of that stuff. Um, it also does this fantastic thing, which is when you pause the game and you unpause it, it does like a second freeze on the screen. So you hit to go out of the pause menu, the screen shows up, you see all the enemies, and it takes like a half a second, and then it starts. So you can like quickly nice. get a lay of the land and go. And and I don't know if they did that on purpose, but it just feels so good when they do that. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm right back in. Um, the other thing I was going to say is this is how I played Diablo during the pandemic, is at some point in Diablo 1, you just have to avoid all the enemies and try to hit them because they're going to hit you for way too much damage. So it just, it felt like this is the, what Diablo should have been all along. Um, it is, it is really good. It's got some hey, of the power ups from Vampire Survivors where it collects quick. all the stuff together. Remember, remember Diablo 4? Yeah, terrible. Because I sure don't. Halls of Torment <laughs> is a better Diablo 4. I know, I've purchased it. I just purchased <laughs> Halls of Torment. I, I gotta be honest, I was a little pissed. I know, I know we're doing Goatee catch up, but when we compiled our goatee list and we we're like, okay, these are the games everybody should play seeing a brand new game. I've never heard of at number seven on your list, along with Basquiat's 2000 at number nine. I was like, which fucking asshole is adding games to my to-do list. But I'm so I, happy that I look at halls of torment and I go, Oh yeah, I'll fucking play this game. I'll fucking play this game. I'm, I, it's not a chore anymore. I want to play this game. I sent my list to Karen with bass uh, with halls of torment at like 20 and as I was playing it, I was just slowly updating it up and up and moving other uh -huh. games down. And I settled at seven. Even Basilisk 2000, I think I could have bumped down. But I at that point, she was calculating. But yeah, Halls of Torment. Basilisk 2000 just for the gall of what they were doing. But Halls of Torment is just so good. Very, very good. Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm excited to play it. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad I can get you with these games. It's funny too cuz I, I keep wanting to message the Discord about them and I was like, "No, I'll wait for local chat, get some get some uh, live reactions." Uh and then Generation 0 uh is like a solid 7 from a couple of years ago. You may remember this. It's very much that artist style. This is the game. <laughs> it's the game you bring up every 3 months where you're like, "We should play Generation 0." And then we look at it and we're like, "Oh, it doesn't have couch co-op." Or we're like, "You know what? Honestly, the reviews aren't good." But I know you really want to play it because you keep bringing it up, but then we always talk ourselves out of it. Yeah. So I'm glad you finally got to play it, and I don't have to potentially play a bad game. So, so uh, it does have four-player co-op. Um, Karen and I have been playing this together. You know, it is a great co-op game. Uh, the robots are just hard enough to take down. Like, you're not going to run into it and just shoot all the robots. You're, like, setting up from a distance. You're like, okay, let's three, two, one, take these guys down. Um you the drop in drop out co-op is so seamless uh everyone everyone gets their own loot uh but you can drop loot and share it but like if i loot a bag you can then go loot the bag um the only thing we notice is if i pick up like a gun placed in the environment it disappears for her but if she picks them up first then i can pick them up so like that sort of stuff oh, okay. i call her over she'll pick it up and we can't tell if that's a glitch or if that's just how it is host, um host guest type thing yeah, but everything else is great. Um, yeah, you start, uh, you're these kids who are returned from summer camp or something, and then all these people are missing. There's robots everywhere. You meet this lady. Uh, you start going through all these bunkers in Sweden, and you're, like, clearing them out of robots, uh, and then you're collecting all this stuff. You're, it's survival, so you're also constructing things. You've got bicycles that you can ride around. Um, it, it, it's legit a really fun time as a co-op game. I can see myself falling off of it fairly like i would have to keep myself playing it if it wasn't co-op but even to the point uh -huh. where karen's like hey you want to play more of that robot game um it's it's pretty fun i i would consider doing a stream with it i i'm pretty sure it is four player co-op um and the fact that if you could install the game and just drop into our game and we can just give you a bunch of stuff like that's great um because yeah that's good that's good yeah, and, and some weapons have tiers of things, but it, it works out really well, and it's fun. Barely paying attention to the story, it's basically like, oh, I think all the all the survivors are here. They're not there. They're at the next place. And it's kind of moving you forward. Uh, 
the robot the sound design's really cool the robots like do these weird like guttural barks and like uh -huh. and like stuff like that and you're like where is the robot and then like the other time the robot is through the uh, is stuck in the corner of a building and you can just shoot him from far away and he won't come after you uh so like i said solid seven uh pushes it up to like an eight with the co-op uh it's really fun so uh yeah generation zero highly recommend uh for co-op cool. if you have a friend it's also on game pass is the other reason we're playing it so uh and and we can play cross pc and xbox which is great as well uh yeah that's it okay let's move into the games jake's been playing this week we can talk about the, no jake is not here this morning tetris ian tetris did you know it was beatable i did not that's why um we're talking about this story u.s teenager has become the first to beat tetris tetris on the nes um so basically what happened was that he got to level 157 which crashed the game it's kind of a kill uh, that's usually what they call a kill screen in the arcade right where you get to a point where the game is just like can't function anymore yeah um people didn't even believe that there was a kill screen and according to the BBC, quote, remarkably, until a few years ago, be people believed it was only possible to play up to level 29, uh, unquote. So it, this is just wild. Did you <laughs> I kind of feel bad for the kid. Did you watch the clip of him celebrating no. when he got it live on Twitch? It's a 13 year old just being like, yes, oh, my God. Oh, oh my no. God. And I'm just like, oh, no, that's a bad clip that he's going to have for the rest of his life. Um, so did you look up anything more about this? I did a little bit. Do you need me to describe Tetris to you? Because I know you've never well, played it before. It had to happen. Um, I, 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 I will describe a little bit because I did look this up. So basically, each level of Tetris, you start at level one. The blocks are falling slowly. You have to, each time you clear a line, that goes to account. And I believe it's if you clear 30 lines, then it goes to the next level. It starts fresh. The blocks fall a little bit faster. You clear 30 lines, you go to the next level. Um, I believe the technique that's really been helping people out lately is something called hyper tapping, which is um, basically if they're doing the technique I've seen, you hold the controller upside down and you basically like flex the controller against your leg and against your fingers so that you can basically like vibrate it to very quickly tap the buttons because the whole thing at higher levels is if, if, if a block comes in the center of the screen and you need it to be right, you have like milliseconds to get it right before it hits the bottom. So you got to be able to like hit right on the D pad, like super quick multiple times. So they basically developed a new technique to press buttons super fast. Um, and with that technique, they're now able to, to beat the game in 38 minutes, which is crazy. You have more details. Yeah, I think it was um, at 153 or four, the colors go away. And so oh, wild. 154 and 155 are, or 153 and 154 are charcoal and gray are the nicknames for them. And then after wow. that, you can't see anything. So at 155, your first chance to get a kill screen, you have to clear one line by itself. And he missed that chance. And he didn't get until 157, I believe, he did that. And that's what killed the game. So people knew how to kill the game, but no one could yeah. do it because it was... You, you, you literally can't see anything on those last couple screens. Um, except yeah. for, like, the coming up, I think you know what's coming. Um, it's coming. So, it's... I mean, it's an incredible achievement. I, whether or not hitting a kill screen is actually beating a game is another discussion. But... Uh, uh, no, it it is. What the fuck are you what the fuck are you talking about yeah. around here? I don't yeah, know. that, that I, there wasn't pretty... a there wasn't a U one screen. It's just a little interesting. I mean, I can unplug the console. It's a kill screen. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I did see that argument though I all shoot over the, the thing, <laughs> and it was just like, like I get because I don't actually think that, but like I get saying, oh, it's just a kill screen. No, I don't beat the game. But I'm like, no, I mean, I see it from a you didn't get credits and it beat the game but oh i don't see it i don't see <laughs> <Shut> it. <laughs> fuck off. they didn't um, add credits then fuck off that's the end you know uh, it's just yeah wild. i mean good for this kid not much yeah. uh going for for this gen that generation so good for him 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah, everybody else out there playing Fortnite. I was so surprised how I was honestly most surprising thing was that he was 13. I'm like, holy shit, the kids aren't just playing Fortnite. Like they actually are continuing like the old retro speedrun tradition. Do you uh, uh well, quick question. Uh do you give any shits at all about a Horizon <laughs> MMORPG? Um only it's funny, more the MMO part than the Horizon part. <laughs> <laughs> Like anytime um, a new MMO is announced, I'm like, oh, that sounds cool. Like, I love a good MMO. <laughs> you know, you guys talked about this. I wasn't on the episode where The Last of Us Online was canceled. Um, did you guys happen to see the leak of the main menu screen from The Last of Us Online? No. Which is another Sony game. It's um, it's it's a screen, right? And it's Last of Us and there's a Last of Us character. And then at the top, it says like it says like play character settings season pass microtransactions money like it's just it's then it's like Ugh. season objectives weekly ob it was just a fucking cash grab game is what it was and it had all the same bad mechanics and this is another sony online service game and i guarantee you it's gonna have the same fucking thing so part of me is like horizon would be a cool world to have an mmo in and you know just think about the world events around a giant you know, uh, Stegosaurus, giraffe, whatever, you know, like it's the makings are all there. I just don't trust Sony to make a good MMORPG because of how they've been treating the live service games they've had so far and had to cancel. And I don't think Horizon. Well, honestly, my big problem with Horizon was just like the story and the progression. So if you just replace that with an MMO based progression, I could be OK with that. So we'll see. We'll see. I think I talked myself into it. We'll see. Yeah, and you never know, like, Last of Us Online or this could be taking lessons from, like, Fortnite in a in a sort yeah. of good way, so it could turn out, but you never know. Or even, honestly, I just want them to do a traditional-ass MMORPG. Free to play, but give me jobs, give me skills that I have to level up, give me different quest lines, give me different hub areas, that's all I need. I don't want Destiny where you have a shitty hub area and you just have a whole bunch of segmented content. You know, I don't want a yeah. whole bunch of I don't want run based with escape the zone type stuff. Give Actually, if you just gave if you. OK, listen, fuckers, if you just made a literal horizon MMORPG, I would probably play it. Mine as well, but it has to be free to play. It has to be free to play. Find your money elsewhere. Be. Um, Ian. Yeah, you can't pretend to jerk off on stream with a black bar over your crotch anymore what the fuck is wrong with twitch like <laughs> everybody knows what needs to happen right which is you need to ban porn on twitch and they are doing everything they can to not ban t porn on twitch to the extent that two policy changes ago they basically allowed porn on Twitch, right? And when they said you can have nudity on Twitch, there was like, uh, you know, it can't really be people nudity. It can only be body painting and it can only be drawn nudity. And all of a sudden you got people drawing rule 34 hentai all over Twitch. It's like, what the fuck did you think was going to happen? Like, why do they keep making the wrong decision here? Like, I have nothing against porn. I have nothing against adult entertainers, et cetera. People who, who draw adult art, not on Twitch. That's not what Twitch is for. And you need to stop trying to make it like that. And Twitch needs to stop like allowing it while not allowing it. And they need to get their fucking policies together. I'm sorry. We're talking about a story. OK, let's let's roll back a little bit. I don't want to take up too much time on this, but the meta was hot tubs, right? Wear a bikini because you're in a hot tub and the Twitch rules say you're allowed to wear a bikini because you're in a situation where you would normally wear those clothes. Right. Mm -hmm. So then. That wasn't enough, right? That wasn't enough to get viewers. So then um, mostly female streamers would start being completely topless, but the camera would cut off right above their nipples. So you would see lots and lots of cleavage and there was implied nudity. And Twitch, Twitch's reaction to that was to say, you know what? We're changing our policy. You can do that. You can also show nudity as long as you're not showing genitalia. And you're allowed to show animated nudity and drawn nudity etc in, in an artistic setting so they basically opened up the floodgates and then for two or three days people were just showing animated porn like on a twitch all the time yeah it was like a day and then they came back and they're like wait a minute we fucked up never mind no nudity um so they rolled that back 
But then the new meta became sensor bars, where you would have streamers who were completely nude, but they had sensor bars either digitally or physically placed over their genitalia, just the genitalia. So they're basically, they called it implied nudity, but it's like 99% nude. And Twitch finally, uh, yesterday or the day before, basically came out and said, we are going to, quote, prohibit implied nudity while streaming on Twitch. Uh, in response to a recent meta in which streamers are using black sensor bars or other items to block their bodies or clothing. It's like how f like how f the I think part of the problem people will always try and get around the rules. But I think the problem is that Twitch is trying to be happy to everybody. And. This may be a little bit controversial, but I think what's happening is that they're falling a little bit into like the the modern mentality of don't victimize anyone. And therefore, we cannot enforce our rules and we have to go the opposite, which is when any group at all gets criticized, we have to come out with a policy that allows that action. So hot tub streamers, that was kind of the start of it. That was women just wearing scantily clad bikinis on Twitch for no reason at all. And Twitch, instead of coming out and saying, no, you have to wear actual real clothes. This is not a porn site. They said, yeah, you know what? Actually, we're going to allow you to do that as long as you have a hot tub in the stream. So what do they do? They put a fucking inflatable hot tub in the <laughs> living room behind them. Like Twitch just needs to come out and be like, we're not a fucking porn site. No, we're not going to allow it. Instead of trying to make everybody happy and please all these different groups and try and be the cool guy that's not going to like victimize different groups or come under any sort of accusation of discrimination. No, that's not the problem here. It's not about discrimination. It's about you're not a porn site. There are so many kids on Twitch. You're killing your site. You're killing your viewer base by allowing this shit on Twitch. I don't know. Am I off, am I off base here? Am I getting no, too upset? No, I, I mean, I, I slightly agree. Like, I think Twitch should... I mean, if, if... I think Twitch has an opportunity to provide a safe space for not safe for work streaming. Um, I, and I only say that because I, I feel like a lot of the major platforms, probably even OnlyFans, Pornhub, all that sort of stuff, exploit a lot of people who try to do that content. Yes. And I think yeah. the moderation and the tools available to a Twitch streamer for a not safe for work streamer are excellent. I think that would be amazing for those those people. Um, yes. Do I think it should be intermixed with regular Twitch? No. Do I think no. Twitch should provide... I think if Twitch did a completely separate site like Twitch NSFW or a completely locked down part of Twitch that you yep. age gated like Reddit, that sort of thing to supply those tools for those people. I think that's perfect. I, I'm not against uh, porn streaming or nudity streaming or even drawing anime titties like yeah. art streaming, all this. I'm not against it. It's the fact that a underage child could accidentally find their way into it that is the kind of gross part for me um or anyone who doesn't want to see that to be honest with you um i like that stuff i wouldn't mind seeing it but i don't think it should be available on regular twitch so i think some sort of compromise yeah. there works i think this you're right about them trying to please all the, they're trying to please their money makers without showing their money milkers uh and it is it is a weird line that they Sorry, walk good. with that um yeah and it, it's kind of annoying but i think those people i think they deserve an opportunity and a nice safe place to do that sort of stuff and i think twitch has that opportunity whether or not they're going to yeah. do it or are the company that should do it i don't think so but uh that's like at least where i stand on it is is that could be something yeah. they could reach eventually i don't think they're ever going to because they're probably they're not a great company and they haven't done things very well and i think i think i think you're totally right it, it's it's it, I'll talk about Twitter briefly. It took me several years of using Twitter every single day to realize, oh, you can have porn on Twitter. Oh, yeah, they they can do. But they do an incredible job of somehow detecting and segmenting that off. So if you want to, you can get into porn Twitter. But if you if you're not into porn Twitter, if you're not viewing those accounts, you're not following any of them, you will not see porn on Twitter. I, I think that's it's it's not quite true today because the company's gone downhill. But yeah. I use that that. I used Twitter for like four or five years before I accidentally clicked on a, a post from somewhere else and came onto Twitter and I was like, oh, they can't post porn on Twitter. And then I was like, wait, they can. They've just hidden it the whole fucking time. Like, that's incredible. That's what they need to do with Twitch. And the, they, they talk about it in here. One of the previous updates they did in the past weeks, they were like, hey, we're going to add this new sexual themes label to your content that you should be putting on your content. And I'm like... 
You're telling me that wasn't on there before. So so you could have you could have somebody, you know, doing one of these metas half nude, 99 percent nude, just saying I'm playing Super Mario Maker and that shit's going to show up for little kids because that game is marked E for everyone. Like there was no indication, nothing in the system to classify it as sexual themes. They just added that a couple weeks ago. And then in this, they talk about, hey, you know, we we sexual themes things were not supposed to be on the main page. But we noticed if you went into a category, like you clicked on Super Mario Maker, it would show you the sexual themes things. Mm -hmm. And you would see thumbnails of just implied nudity everywhere. So we're going to now add a way to blur that nudity. And I'm like, when you add not safe for work content on your page, on your website, because you you allow it, which is what Twitch is doing, it's not a catch up game. It's not a go ahead, do whatever the fuck you want, and we'll come in after it and start implying these mechanisms, uh, start start applying these mechanisms to block it for certain underage viewers, et cetera. No, this is super serious. It's like credit card payments. You know, you have to have the fucking security mechanisms in place first, and then you open it up to users. Yeah. They are doing this completely backwards, and it's it's fucked. And I get upset because it's, you know, I, I, my nephews, they watch Twitch and it's like, I don't want them coming across this content. We we stream on Twitch to a completely separate audience from these implied nudity streamers, but we're having to fight with them because their shit is showing up next to ours because Twitch is not forcing them to do labeling, etc. until recently. So it's just like, look, Will, I'm sorry. If you put our stream next to porn, we're always going to lose. I, if I see our stream next to porn, I'm clicking the porn, right? Yeah, like, why the fuck would I watch us? And the problem is like, exactly like you said, they're going after the money makers on the porn side without realizing that those money makers don't give a shit about Twitch. Twitch is not about porn. You can have a not safe for work section, but you've got to go to your core base and your core base is gamers and craft streamers, etc. cetera. Yeah. And, Sorry, and I'm again, getting upset. <sighs> yeah. And I should clarify as well. I have no issue with people using what God gave them to make money. Make that money. I'm fine with it too. Make yeah, that it, money. Just I'm honestly me, more upset not on Twitch. I was if yeah. I was blessed with a beautiful body and uh and 12 inches of God, you... then maybe I would make some money. But I've I only got 8 guys. I only got 8. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's yeah. it's I I I think I think you hit the nail on the head which is like it's already in the community in a way Twitch needs to heavily implement a bifurcation between not safe for work content and safe for work yeah. content and specifically sexualized content and non-sexualized content. Um, they really need to do that and they need to do it rapidly because these policy changes where they're just having to implement a policy change, revert it two days later, heavily modify it. The community will always outstrip you if you give them space on the main page to ap apply their meta. You need to fucking quarantine them. Give them their own space. Let them go hog wild. With some with some clear rules like, you know, no penetration, no genitalia. And. Good to go, you know, but quarantine them for fuck's sake. What the fuck are they doing over there? <laughs> <laughs> Only no or double penetration, but no single penetration. <laughs> no single only no or double. God. I, you know, the crazy thing is, like, all the shit they've been... This would never happen, but all the... Do you remember when Fortnite, when Epic got in trouble for... I forget what exactly it was for, but they basically got in trouble for exposing a lot of inappropriate monetization mechanisms to children. And there's laws that, like, prevent you from doing that to kids. There's laws preventing you from showing, you know, pornography and sexualized things to kids. Twitch could go bankrupt tomorrow if the government actually looked into it and said, wait a minute, you're showing these tits to everybody and you and your stats show us that you have at any moment in time, 100,000 underage viewers and they're just seeing this on the main page. Like, I don't know how they're not freaking out about this because this is how companies die because they have inappropriate content and they don't age gate it properly. And that shit comes with fines. It's like. I'm just making up a number here, but I believe it's a per offender fine. So it's like 2000 bucks per kid per offense. And it's Jeez. like that shit will bankrupt you so quick. It's, it's wild. It's wild. Um, <clears throat> yeah, crazy, crazy stuff, Twitch. <clears throat> um, do you want to skip to the wish list spot? I'm assuming you got to leave in a minute. Yeah, let's just skip it. I mean, the other stuff, nothing super, super crazy here. 
Yeah. You, or sorry, I want to. I meant to say, do you want to skip to wish list spotlight? You want to just go through it quick? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so Silent Hill Two remake and Metal Gear Solid Snake Eater remake are set to release in 2024, according to a PlayStation blog post. What's this joke about? I I meant. Do you want to skip to wish list spotlight and just go through the wish list spotlight quick? I. So I feel like I said yes, and then you and then you backed up and said no. I mean, do you oh, want to skip? No, I apologize. I thought I thought you thought I was skipping. Wish- okay, just do wish list spotlight. <laughs> Un- is this is this mine i thought you put it there unless jake put it there i think jake put it there oh let's i wrote a great call let's for skip, no reason let's skip wishlist spotlight okay this week, let's then, get wishlist spotlight okay let's get out of here i'll tell it's you what the wishlist spotlight is wishlist spotlight folks is halls of torment go check it out <laughs> go check it out please it's so good uh okay i'm gonna hit the outro button then. folks thanks so much for being here uh you can find us subpixelfilms.com where you can find all of our beautiful beautiful content i've been your host will crosby that has been ian gibson joining me the weather is looking great in dallas today 38 degrees 58 degrees i'm very excited for that uh don't forget to adjust your vcr um we will be back uh sunday at 4 p.m with a wonderful david from save data we'll be playing some psycho knots uh episode four i believe i apparently we've done three of those and i don't remember any of them uh, I just remember the milkman. Um, and then, of course, Tuesday, I don't know what we're doing. Uh, Speedrunners. Speed Speedrunners speed runners on Tuesday. We're gonna, yeah, we're going to try and premiere Speedrunners. Not sure the time yet, because we may do longer apps. We'll, we'll have to see. It's going to be fun. Uh, and then local chat again on Thursday. Uh, yeah, thanks, everyone. And we'll see you all next week. <laughs>